Hello and welcome to another edition of Real Men Feel. I am Andy Grant. Real Men Feel was founded as uh, a space to allow men to, to allow for and acknowledge and feel all of their emotions. Now, we're not saying that you're supposed to always be happy. We're not saying you're always supposed to be angry and grumpy. We just encourage you to allow for all of your emotions. So that's what the show is about. And with me, as always, is my co-host and friend, Apio Hunter. How are hey, you today? Hey. Fantastic. Awesome, awesome. And we are color-coded today. Yeah. We are. Yes, we got the memo. All right, cool. <laughs> and um, we're going to, the, the show is usually about 30 minutes, and you're welcome to partake. We are live every Tuesday on Blab at 5 p.m., and then the recordings are sent to SoundCloud, iTunes, and YouTube. So if you're catching us there in the replay, thanks. And if you're catching us live, feel free to jump in with comments and questions, and you can learn more about past shows and future shows at realmenfeel.org. So, with all of that out of the way, I want to welcome our, our guest this week is attorney, speaker, and author, actually international speaker, um, Lee Daniel. Yeah. So, and Lee, you're a divorce attorney from Alabama? That's right. Thank you, uh, Andy and Athia, for having me on the show today. Cool, cool. And we want to talk about um, acknowledging the pain of divorce. Yeah, I've seen a lot of that. Yeah. So... Sure. Uh, did, is acknowledging the pain, is it something that, that everybody involved with the divorce has trouble kind of admitting that they're in pain or is it, is it men specifically that you see it or how's, how's that? I, I definitely see a difference between when a man comes in and wants to share with me how, how hurt they are or if they're feeling lost, they're embarrassed and they'll say to me, I'm so sorry. Like a woman will cry unapologetically in the office. A woman will share with me how she feels devastated. But a man, on the other hand, will often be so embarrassed that they won't look at me or they'll say, I'm embarrassed, I'm ashamed, I shouldn't be acting like this. And I'll always tell them, of course, you. I mean, this is like one of the most important things that ever happened to you. Of course, you're going to be upset. But they feel they seem to feel a real hesitancy in sharing. How they feel? Would you say that has a lot to do with the cultural influences, particularly where you are in, in the southern states? Yes, <laughs> I, would think, <laughs> I would think in the south, but also, but I think I do think that men are beginning to share more because, especially in Alabama, we have a lot of joint custody, so men have to be willing to share more with the courts, with their attorney, why they want to have custody of their children why it's important to them to spend time with their children. So they are having to share their feelings a lot more than in previous years. And, and they're so it sounds like they're, it's almost like they're court ordered to feel. Well, that'd be great. No, there, no, it's just that when you're asking for custody and you're in a courtroom and you're sharing with the judge, why you want custody, it's important to share, at least from my perspective as a lawyer, it's important to share the reasons behind why you want custody, you know, have a really close relationship with my son. Uh, it, it's important to me to spend time with my child. I want to nurture the relationship. Whereas before it was always the mother that was in that nurturing, caring for position. But if men are asking for custody, and I think that they should equally or at least share custody, then they need to be willing to express their feelings about it. Why do they want custody? So my parents got divorced, um, it was in the early 70s, and divorce was still pretty rare, and it was very acrimonious. They, they did not speak to each other during it. it. It was nasty and evil, and that's kind of been my perception of how all divorces are, but is, is, is that still the common case, or? No, I wouldn't say that most cases are, are that way. I would say that most of the time that people have the forethought to think about, you know, they're trying to think about their kids. What's going to be best for my child? And it's certainly not for them to be angry, but that doesn't happen all the time. Sometimes people are talking about each other in front of their children, which is really horrible, or they'll say, oh, but I was talking to my mother, but the child was in the room, right? So they mm -hmm. knew that you were talking about your spouse. So they, they come in all shapes and sizes, Andy. <laughs> All the divorces. <laughs> yeah. I am kind of curious because my parents, when they got divorced, theirs was actually a no contest divorce. Theirs was like pretty much straightforward, mutually agreed upon. Um, my dad didn't contest anything pretty much because he really didn't want anything. Um, but you know, in, in, in your experience, I mean, what percentage of them are like uncontested? Is it like a really small number or is it like a large? 
larger number? I mean, how, how many of them are actually the friendly, quote unquote, friendly divorces, if you will? Well, I haven't done any kind of research on that. I, mm -hmm. I probably should have. But Anecdotally. I say, yeah, I would say, yeah, I don't know. I would say there's a lot of uncontested divorces, but I'm, but they may not come to me specifically because I've been practicing a long time and they may not feel they need a lawyer that has the kind of experience or costs as much as I do. So the uncontested that are probably a lot more frequently than I would know about are going to probably younger lawyers, the cheaper, unless they're long-term marriages that have a lot of assets. Gotcha. So I think it's probably very common, a lot more common than I could just tell you from my own statistics. Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. And, and is it more common today to have have the attorney kind of encourage the clients to, to feel? Um, I can't speak to everybody. Um, I would say that's what I do. I mean, I encourage them to to accept their feelings. And I, I do know that there are other there are other lawyers that that discourage them and say, you know, because I've had clients say I felt judged for being upset. I felt like I shouldn't. How, you know, I shouldn't be arguing about this. I shouldn't be feeling this way. But I encourage you guys know my philosophy. So I encourage everybody to feel and to share and, and to really express the emotions that they're going through. So this but is something that you, you've come into this and discovered it yourself. It wasn't, it wasn't part of law school at all. No. Okay. There's yeah, no bedside be. manner rules for lawyering. There's nobody teaching you this is how you treat people when they're in pain. And you know, so a lot of lawyers don't have, don't acknowledge that, acknowledge that it is very painful. Oh, so, so if then this notion of acknowledging the pain, it's not just the clients, it's, it's for the attorneys or everybody, everybody involved. Sure. And I think that especially, um, and I, you know, I love the judges that we have in Madison County, but I do think that people become very, um, how they become acclimated to things like adultery and to mistreatment or to verbal abuse because they've heard it so many times. And so while it might be something that totally destroyed your life, the judge is like, I don't want to hear this, right? Because they're thinking in the scheme of things, doesn't matter. But it, to that person, sometimes they just want to share why they're devastated, how they feel. And and the court, and I understand the court doesn't have time to listen, but that does squelch, you know, squelch the person's feelings and kind of squashes them when they want to share that. Yeah, yeah. So it's really another part of society that says, "Don't feel right. right? Yeah. Your, your feelings really don't matter." How wow. So that's going to be horrible if, if someone's getting divorced because you know in the marriage their feelings haven't mattered, and then they feel treated that same way by the court system. That's going to just be horrible. Right. Well, that makes me sad because that's exactly what it's like. You know, because people will say, well, he's been cheating or they've done this or they've done that. And I'll have to say, I'm sorry, but that's really not going to be that big of a deal. And they want to share that with the court. Mm -hmm. um, In your experience, how does the divorce affect the personality of kids? Uh, the personality of the children? Yeah. I'm not really qualified to address that. So, I mean, I'm, I don't I don't work with children, so um, I, I, I know that I tell people that the best way for them to serve their children is for them to be happy. So I want, you know, I'd rather see two happy people parenting their children than two miserable people staying together, fighting in front of their children, um, yelling, arguing. You know, I don't want kids to see that. But as far as how their personality is affected, I don't know. You know, Ahmed, I could probably talk to that a little bit based on my own personal experience. Because when my parents separated, even though it was a friendly separation between the two of them, they had spent many, many years fighting. They had spent many years in you know, massive disagreements. And yeah. having witnessed that, it, it did affect me emotionally. And in some ways, I kind of internalized it. I thought that I was responsible somehow for the, you know, the conflict that was going on between my parents. And so... I, when, when my dad left, sure, go ahead. Um, but when, when, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. Oh, okay. Um, but no, re real quick. Um, when, when, I'll just finish up the story for the benefit of those who are watching. When those who were, you know, when, when my dad left, I felt like I was a favorite. 
because I felt like it was on my shoulders to somehow keep the family together. Of course, many years later, after going through you know, loss of depression, bipolar disorder, those were all separate, but obviously exacerbated by my parents' divorce, um, I took on a lot of that responsibility. And it took a lot of years of therapy, a lot of years of coming to love myself and getting, getting through that for me to realize that I was never responsible anyway. So, so I, I actually really like that question because there can be an impact on the kids, even if they seem to be resilient on the outside. Um, it can either make them more resilient or they can internalize a lot of the pain and just keep it locked up and not let it out, which then you know, continues the cycle, which can go into their, their adult relationships, which then can result in other divorce and so forth. I mean, I had many, many failed relationships prior to the one that I'm in, that I'm in now. I and mean, we've been together for going on 15 years now. So, but it took a lot of you know, trial and error, if you will. And a lot of, even though no formal divorces, um, a lot of very, very painful splits. Yeah. And I think that's really common. The kids taking responsibility, yeah. whether the divorce is friendly, good, bad, indifferent, they, if, especially if they're not being talked to. And the worst, they kind of assume yeah. it's our fault. The worst is just putting the children in the middle. And I, and you know, and I know that we are here advocating for people having feelings, and I definitely think that we should, but there's, and I don't even know how to do this, but there has to be a way that the parents don't load their kids up with their feelings about the other party, because that is really damaging. So mm. I, we want people to feel, but I would say that you should not share that with your kids. You should definitely not say how hurt you are by that other person, because then the child is just caught. Who am I going to align with? And you want your child to be insulated from that, even though we want people to share their feelings, it's more appropriate to share with a therapist or a coach or an energy worker than, you know, like Andy and Appio both do those kind of things. And it's just, you know, we want to share, but not with our kids. Yeah. And yeah, sh sharing adult emotions and issues and problems with a child with, is always going to go <laughs> wrong. It, 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 issues. it does Sorry. create issues. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, what happens is the kids are oftentimes the closest, most easily accessible yes. persons that we can just dump on them. Yeah. And just go, yeah, here's our, all of our emotions. And sorry, I gave that to you, but yeah, okay, you'll be fine. And no, <laughs> that, it doesn't they'll work that way. They'll try to pick out a side. They'll try to be like, yeah. who do I, you know, and that's just puts them in a terrible situation. Yeah. And, and, and it is not a terrible situation. Again, speaking to my own experience, I felt really bad because I didn't want to take a side. Obviously, I saw that my mom was the one who, well, she was the one who displayed more emotion. So therefore, I, and being an empath, I sensed what she was going through far more than what my dad was. My dad was just completely walled off. And he actually was exceptionally good at not showing any sort of emotion whatsoever and keeping himself from displaying it or even permitting himself to feel it. So it was easy for me eventually, even though I did not want to take sides, it was easy for me to go over and take those sides. So I have a question for you guys, you two feelers. Um, <laughs> so if you are, like I see a lot of people, a lot of men that go through divorce and that don't want to acknowledge their feelings, even though they're in serious pain, what would you say? I mean, I, that's not my area of expertise, but what, what would you tell them? Because what I do send them doing is using a lot of addictive behaviors, um, dumping into relationships, sometimes before the, you know, the divorce is finished, which I'm like, for the love of God, wait. But because they're trying, I know what's going on, <laughs> trying to numb that. But mm -hmm. what are some ways that if you're in that space, that you can that you can allow yourself to feel rather than do those things and you're well it, it it's up to that person all all you can do or any friend is like make them aware right. like you you know you're doing this to to hide from your feelings and those feelings are going to come out eventually and they're going to come out out of your control mm -hmm. if you keep trying to ball them up but but you know i've always thought that divorces that are really angry and antagonistic it, it's a battle over nobody wanting to admit how hurt they are yeah. how sad they really are yeah. and i just think if you're willing to soften if you like you know if you if you can cry if you're you know if you're a man you let yourself go without having to get drunk or high to show your emotions or thinking that they somehow make you less of a man so you need to get drunk or high to prevent yourself from having emotions but you know it all starts with awareness but each individual has to feel that that block enough 
to know that they, they need to get those emotions. And out. another thing that I think, Andy, I've heard you say before, um, that when you have emotions and it's diverted towards anger, um, I, I, def, I don't know what, I can't remember what you said. I've definitely heard it. But sometimes it's just they're hurt in their pain, but instead of acknowledging that, they'll decide to take the attack. You know, we'll be fighting. And really it's just because they're in so much pain. And so instead of just acknowledging how much pain they're in, they're like, I'm going to take everything from them. I'm going to take the kids from them. Um, that's just diverting their feelings. Yeah. And, and it, again, it's coming in lots of situations, but instead of me getting hurt again, I'm going to come after you. Yeah. <laughs> and it's unfortunate, but, but, but Apia, what, what would you say as a way to help people feel? Much worse? of what you said, you know, first and foremost, acknowledge your feelings and right. allow yourself to feel, give yourself permission to feel. No, you are a human being. No, male, female, it doesn't matter. Being a human being means that we're going to have feelings, that we're going to, you know, to, to go through those things. Even if it means that you have to do so privately, even if it means whether it is in the security of your attorney's office and, you ha and you're fortunate enough to have an attorney like Lee who is willing to listen. Lee Daniel, attorney at law, 551 just Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Just yeah, and but, but you know, if you're fortunate enough to actually have that, then then find some kind of a safe space to be able to acknowledge that and and let it go. But more so, you know, acknowledge that when you're in that, you know, when you're going through that type of emotional turmoil, what happens is that we feel emotionally cornered as well. And just like a, an animal will lash out when it feels cornered, we yeah. also. When we are emotionally cornered, we feel like we have no options to go out. We are going to lash out as well. Yeah. And so, so much of it boils down to acknowledgement, self-love, and permission. Yeah, I, I have a case once that I think you guys, that's pretty interesting. So made me think of that. So I have a client I've represented many, many years, and he's a very sensitive, really sweet guy. So his, his, um, his ex-wife married a guy that was very physically abusive. He tried to strangle her, actually had a felony conviction in another state. And we went back to court three times. We've been back to court with this guy because the guy was physically abusive to the mom and the kids were there. The last time he assaulted the guy's daughter and the woman makes, makes fun of my client in the court, her to her attorney, like, he, you know, why is he making a big deal of this? Why is he such a baby? Why is he so this? I mean, and I'm, you know, and unfortunately, and the other attorney even act like that. The other attorney was like, oh, what's the big deal? All he did was pull her hair. This is his daughter. This is my client's daughter. He pulled her hair and pushed her. And, and you know, they tried to, to make my client look like he was being overly sensitive or he was being somehow lesser than a lesser than man because he had these feelings and they would say something like oh well you know this guy's six foot tall and your daughter's this and this he couldn't have really you know he wouldn't have really hurt her. i mean it was just you know it was incredible but my client is so has been so grateful to me because mm -hmm. i have been like nurse you know i've been his lawyer for almost 10 years now you know but it's it all the time you know that that speaks so much to the cultural conditioning that we yeah. have regarding these so-called appropriate and inappropriate male roles. Yep, yep. And why so many men are emotionally constipated. I don't really like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's, that's my term that I use. They just they bottle it not up. my thing at all. <laughs> <laughs> that's just the term I've, I've used frequently. But no, yeah, they just no. they don't they don't allow it to feel. They they block it all up. They bottle it all up, and they don't no, allow their, their emotions to 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 flow. And and yeah, I mean, as as Andy said, you know, that can result in so many issues down the road, and that includes judgment, labeling, um, belittling other men because yes. other men actually acknowledging that they are human beings and that they are human beings with feelings. Yeah, and emasculating because you have feelings. Yeah. You know? yeah. One thing I put it when when friends I've known are going through divorce and and they're getting they're in their angry phase and they want you to pick sides. I just remind them like, at some point you love that person, or at some point you at least believed you love right. that person. Mm -hmm. And and I've always you know if you anyone you've ever loved, there's always that connection, right? You can decide you don't love them anymore or you've had enough or whatever. But if they just remember that at some point I really loved you. 
So, you know, let me acknowledge it. Let me acknowledge my, my grief and perhaps shame and, and guilt that, 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 that something I loved that is now didn't work out. You know, I'm, I'm going to end it. So I, I think there's a period of and a feeling of mourning that kind of isn't in the system anywhere. And, and mm -hmm. the denying of that, that mourning, that loss is what makes so much, you know, sense of betrayal show up. Which brings up an interesting point regarding the whole divorce process. I mean, do you have a process that you use or do you refer people who, after they've gone through their divorce and the papers are signed and so forth, do you work with people or do you send people to work with others that, to go through that legitimate grieving process at, over the, the, the death quote unquote death of that relationship? It depends on the client. And if they, if I can, if I can see what they're going through, I definitely do. Yeah. I have a referral uh, system and I send people to uh, various people to, to work those kind of things out. They don't always share all of that stuff with me. Some of them so, do. Uh, I used to say when I was a new lawyer that I'm not a therapist, but if I were, I'd have to charge you double. And so <laughs> <laughs> now I think they would think that 600 an hour or 650 an hour is a little too much to pay. So I don't make that joke anymore. But I, something that one of you said a second ago is really, really important. Um, it's going back to how that either that cage to animal piece or not acknowledging your feelings because this all this hate and vitriol and things that I see people doing, spending thousands of dollars because they won't acknowledge that they're really feeling hurt. And instead of feeling, acknowledging that hurt, acknowledging that that person that they love, because they won't even acknowledge that they, I'll get people on the stand and say, well, didn't you love this? You know, can you think of any good qualities about this person? No. Are there any good qualities this person as a parent? No, they're a terrible mother or they're a terrible dad. I'm like, okay, wait a minute. You know, if they were such a terrible dad, why did you, you know, I mean, it's just, Right. Yeah, you must be a horrible judge of character then if you fell for this person. <laughs> right. And he decided to actually you know, go through right. <laughs> somehow just teaching teaching people to address the real underlying issue rather than just start with that anger. And I think though that men I may be labeling, the feelers may get me, but then I think that labeling that, you know, I think it may be worse because of society, I'm sure, but they don't ever want to acknowledge that they're hurt, but they're mm -hmm. all pissed off. Well, you know, humans use labels so that we can make sense of the world around us. Sure. And, and you know, and yeah, we even assign labels to the labels. You know, we can <laughs> say, you know, this feeling is good, this feeling is bad or right. whatever. But, but ultimately, you know, the labels can serve a purpose if we acknowledge them as first of all being labels and then secondly just uh, saying, okay, you know, this, these labels are here so we can have a dialogue and we can make sense and we can move forward. Yeah. Yeah, I find, you know, no human being was created to live in emotional pain, mm -mm. but anyone's refusal to feel all of their emotions ends up creating their own emotional pain. Mm -hmm. But, you know, certainly I know when I was in the midst of that pain, you, know, you couldn't convince me of that. You know, I, I've shared the, the saying before, you can be right or you can be happy. Yep. And for a long time, I thought being right was way more important. I'd rather be right and miserable, but then, I realize, you know, well, sometimes when you when you start to really allow for all of your feelings, there are magical times where you're both right and happy. And, and, and that's what like, that's where the joy of life really is. Right. And, and one thing that I do, and you guys obviously know this about me, is I try to steer people towards what can we what can we do instead of be focused on hate and anger and um, all the things that happened in the past? How can we focus on your future? How can we focus on what you have to be grateful for, how, you know, and I, I constantly, I mean, like a steering, let's go this way, let's go this way. You know, I'm not good at directions, but I know that um, mm -hmm. because they, they really, a lot of times people want to stay in that place of um, what happened before and they don't want to move on. Mm. Yeah. They're, they're trying to get you on their side to prove that they were right. Yes. When I first started trying to be positive all the time, you know, I was really trying. And so clients would come in and sit at this very desk and they would say, isn't he an asshole? I'm doing that accent, you know, and I'd say, I'd say now, no, you know, and they'd say, well, isn't that the best asshole? And they just really wanted me to say they're an asshole. And I'd be like, I don't know that. I'm not going to say they're an asshole. And I would see trying to circumvent getting into that hole. And one week in particular, I got three people came in and nobody retained me. And I thought, what happened? 
And that was that week I definitely felt like a crossroads because I knew that the way I'd been practicing law before and the way I was practicing law now were so divergent that people weren't hiring, the same people weren't hiring me. And I thought, oh my God, you know, I'm either going to have to be a mean lawyer or I'm going to go broke, but it's worked out. <laughs> Good. So that's something I did want to ask. So a thread at a law school, you were not intuitively asking people how they felt and encouraging them to feel. This is something that you've, you've fallen, I want to say fallen into, you've chosen right, in your career. Right. Yeah. It's a yeah. conscious choice. And no. I think yeah. in and domestic relations, that's by far going to be the lawyer that people come back to because this is when you're, you're most vulnerable. I mean, this is when, you know, you really need somebody who cares about you and what's happening in your life. And there are a lot of successful lawyers that I know that just treat people like, you know, they're just pieces of paper, you know, they're just a file number. Um, but well, that, that's their own way to not acknowledge the pain. Mm -hmm. That they're living in every day of their work life, right? Sure. So they, you know, that that's their comfort zone. That's the easy way to navigate that. But but again, it'll catch up. Is you know, high alcoholism, drug abuse, lazy, 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 high rates of all the bad things in life for, for a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, you you shared a lot of lawyer stories with us about you know that you know that. Are there are no lawyers watching that are waiting. <laughs> We're talking your personal some lawyer stories, you know, about when you were when you loved your, uh, you know, your your coping mechanisms. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's why I can recognize yeah. them when other people are doing them. I know what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, there was a guy that came in around Christmas time, married for thirty five years, absolutely devastated, sobbing in my office, and I think he's remarried in, in like three months. And I'm thinking, oh my, you know. Mm -hmm. What's gonna, you know, but I have a lot of repeat customers that way, so I shouldn't really complain. You know, right? <laughs> I even said, because the guy, you know, was pretty successful, I said, please don't run out and immediately find a new relationship. Please, you know, I tried to caution him, but what do you do, right? Do, do you charge more or less for a second and third divorce? Well, for sometimes people? I start giving the multiple, you know, the multi discount sometimes, but not. See, I think you should charge more. You didn't learn your lesson, now it's double the fee. No, I just feel like they're like, you know, they're coming home. They're like, repeat customer, repeat customer. And, you know, and I should stop saying this, I'm like, but now I'm getting used to it because people are all like, are you Brian's, so Brian is uh, my roommate and people say, are you Brian's mom? And I'm really sick of that. But it's like coming home to mom now, you know, come on back. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it's very important. Yeah, so so the people that know that they intuitively want to feel and it helps them heal, yeah, they they do keep coming back to you. They'll so come on so, back and they'll so, say, oh. So was it was it just a period of about that one week where you were making your conscious shift that you wondered, are there any clients for me in this world and this in this feeling realm? Yeah, because I definitely thought nobody's going to hire me now because three different people had come in and they were very and maybe it was just the universe's way of saying, okay, you got to choose because they were so in that space of hate, hate, hate. And I would say, this isn't really helping. I don't know if you guys have ever been to the ball field, but the ball field is one of the greatest precursors for fights between Ferrum families that I've ever known. So I have you know, tons of ball field fights going on. And these people wanted to talk about what happened at the ball field. I mean, thousands of dollars have been spent talking about what happened at the ball field. And I, I just said, is this really a productive lawsuit? Um, you know, it's five thousand dollars, and we can talk about what happened in the back seat at the ball field. But and they didn't. They were like, "Okay, I'm not." You know, they didn't hire me. Maybe but, we should actually amend Andy's statement to say you should. You can be right and broke or happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, sometimes it's just not worth. Well, and I shouldn't stop saying this. I'd probably have a nicer car, but sometimes it's just not worth spending that money because you're you're mad at somebody. In this mind. is going to sound like an oxymoron, but if you're an honest lawyer, so of course you're going to speak your heart, you're going to speak your mind. Right. And you're not going to want to take advantage of folks. So, I mean, speak no, to you and your character. People can find other lawyers, and I'll tell them that. Look, I'm yeah. going to tell you that's not a good idea, but you're going to be able to find somebody that will file that lawsuit if you want them to. Yeah. yeah. I get it. It's, it everything's rooted in energy mm -hmm. and the, the cliche that misery loves company. So I'm miserable. I want to have a miserable divorce. I want to be angry. And if you're not going to join me in my anger, then yeah, you're not my attorney. No. And, and I think that's good for you. And I go to court and I look around and nobody will smile at me. 
So I'm just in the courtroom trying to smile, I'm looking around like, hey, and nobody's smiling at me. Um, I remember once I saw it was the opposing side and it was the, a beautiful girl and I represented the, her husband and I said, wow, you look absolutely stunning today. And she's like, oh, thank you, Miss Daniel. And when she left, she waved and her lawyer like swatted her hand and was like, don't wave at her. You know, like we're not supposed to acknowledge that we're just people. Right. Yeah. First and foremost, we are people, male, female, whatever. First and foremost, we feel. And when we're going through divorce, we really feel. Yeah. Even if we don't want to acknowledge it. Right. Yeah. Or we really try hard not to and makes it all mm -hmm. worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, I frequently use the, the, the example of a dam. You know, so our emotions, I always you know, like to say that our emotions are like a river. And when we bottle them up, when we keep them from flowing, it's like putting a dam on it. But unlike a dam in the physical world, where the engineers can put all kinds of things in place to keep it free, keep the foundations from being undercut. In the emotional realm, that doesn't happen. Eventually, the, those foundations will collapse, and when those emotions all come out, it, it ain't pretty. Mm. So. so, so when you have a new client, or in the middle of, of um, uh, you know, a, a case with someone, and you can tell that they're just, you know, they're, they're hitting their personal rock bottom. They're they're furious. They're striking out, and you can tell they're just not. It's because they're not feeling. You know, how, how do you just give them, say, this is a safe space? Do you give them the, the shoulder to lean on? Like, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I, I listen to them, sure. I mean, I suggest that they, if they need to go to therapy or if they need to go away for the weekend or if they need to take some time on their own or, I mean, that's the best. I, those are all that I tell them sometimes to journal. I tell them to um, be kind to themselves, be gentle with themselves, you know, because a lot of times there's a lot of guilt. There's, there's all kinds of things. And because... Even though we we're getting, we're certainly getting a little more up to date in the world. I live in the South, and sometimes there's just a tremendous amount of familial pressure to stay married because, you know, I'm the first person in my family to get divorced, or I'm a failure because I get divorced, or and I see that kind of thing still. Mm -hmm. You know, it's still really, um, you know, I, what are the people at church going to think? One lady said, "There's no way I can tell everybody at church I'm getting divorced." I said, "Well." You know, you're going to let, I mean, I think it was a physical abuse situation. I said, so you're not going to tell him that he hits you either, right? But, yeah. And it, is, that st is that one of the uh, kind of the most common issues? You're seeing a lot of physical abuse in, um, in, in most cases? No, I don't see a lot of physical abuse, but I do see occasional physical abuse. I see a lot more verbal abuse, which is really hard for people to quantify and, and hard for us to make the court understand how painful it is. Had a case recently um, where these two little boys were, um, that one of them was like 15 and one was 13 and they had to go to their dads and their dad would call them a pussy. Can I say pussy? Anyway, their dad was calling them I said a worse. Um, you know, was really belittling them, was shooting dogs in the yard. Like if a dog would come in the yard, he would shoot guns. He was so like, rule to these kids. I mean, the things that he would say. And the judge just was like, you need to get, you know, you need to get out of that sign. You know, he's just, it, it was just ridiculous that the judge didn't see how much this kid was, how these kids were hurting. And we had therapists there. We had, and the judge and the guy acknowledged, yes, I get really angry. And yes, I've shot at the dogs. And yes, I've called him names, but the judge still sent him right back to visitation. Yeah, unfortunately, some of the, you know, the rooted in the oldest ways are judges, right? right? They kind of they're usually older by the time you become a right. judge or you so you could have been the old generation. You, you're not you're not allowed to feel yourself, perhaps. Yeah. So, and, and, and judges yeah. do what they do best. They oftentimes end up being very human and judging in the process. So and these kids are just, you know, one of them is just like hiding in his room. He has anxiety now. He's got a, he's got a nervous tick. He's got all kinds of problems. That the judge is sending him right over back over there. Wow. Uh, one of the another question that popped into my mind, you know, while you were talking about this, is how often do you deal with situations where the father or the the spouse, the husband, they're they're seeking a a divorce because of that emotional distance that they simply are not engaged. Oh, well, all the time. I mean, something's going on. Right. I mean, that's probably the number one reason is that mm. they don't. They're not compatible anymore. You know, that's our kind of our boilerplate divorce is that they just don't, 
they don't have that spark anymore or whatever. But there's and then there's underlying things. You know, there's financial sure. problems. There's you know, there's adultery. There's verbal abuse. There's all kinds of things. There's no sex. There's all kinds of things. Sure, sure, yeah. Which goes to reinforce the point, I guess, that we're making, Andy, is that real men do feel. <laughs> and when yeah. you feel, maybe we won't have to reach the point where we have to use your services, and then you can go do some, something else that you really love, right, Lee? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, and, that, and it's, it's really, unfortunately, it's, now, you know, talking about the need to feel and the, willing to, and the willingness to feel your emotions, it's almost like a divorce is the easy way out. Like, well, I get this divorce, and now I legally don't have to feel my emotions. Right? We can leave all this stuff unresolved, and I'll go away with my years of baggage and you know, have more crippling relationships that don't work out, but because the court said, I don't have to feel, and now go your own and way. Let me say one more thing, and again, I'm thinking, I hope nobody's from Huntsville's watching, but we have a really super high divorce rate in Huntsville, Alabama, and I know that it's because we have a huge rate of engineers here, and they're not the most communicative group. They tend to um, shut down. They don't want to communicate. They don't want to... You know, we'll ask, we'll have spreadsheets like, you know, I can't even tell you how many spreadsheets, but when it comes to actually talking, it's very difficult. So I think that we have, that's one of the reasons we have such a high divorce rate. Rather than communicate your needs, they get divorced or they cheat and then they get divorced. I still love yeah. y'all. Y'all yeah. are watching. I still love y'all. <laughs> I still want to represent you. I don't care what you've done. It's fascinating you, you should bring that up, though, because I have I certainly have found in my own work, in my own observations, and again, this is, this is anecdotal. I would love to maybe put together my own study on this, but uh, the left brain folks, especially the ones that are inclined towards mathematics, engineering, physics, my parents were accountants, um, can be very um, emotionally switched off. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they prefer to go with the logic and not acknowledge the feelings that they have. And the best way of dealing with it is to either avoid it or become extremely hostile. Extremely what? Hostile. Oh, I thought you were said constipated again. I'm like, that's, <laughs> that's, 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 <laughs> no, I'm not coming back if you keep talking about potty stuff. No, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> no hostile. Uh, <laughs> real men talk about the potty. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes, not always. <laughs> All right. Well, we well we we've talked about a lot about uh you know the gunk of, of divorce. I do want to uh, give a chance and change the subject a bit and and acknowledge um, something that you have founded, Lee, called Project Positive yes, Change, yes. which certainly sounds a lot different than spreading divorces through Alabama. Yeah. Right? So you want to tell me a little bit about Project Positive? Yeah. Change? So. As a result, actually, I'm sure of uh, the 22 or so years that I've been practicing law, I saw a tremendous need for uh, solutions for people and that people that come in to see me. In fact, now I start to evaluate the people in my office. Who can I refer them to? Because I see that they have so many needs that that they, they need help, right? They need help from such a variety of things. And so Project Positive Change is an online marketplace for solutions where people can find coaches or find whatever the problem they're having, if it's that they're having problems being happy or they're having problems learning how to, to work with their children or their relationships, we, we have an expert um, who can help them. And so instead of just taking a blind stab into the internet, you can actually find a curated group of experts that have been vetted and reviewed, and you can look for somebody that you can rely on. And so I'm excited about it because we were just launching it to the public and there's many more things to come, but it's, it's definitely, I think a great way for people to find a resource. And you want to share about kind of the, the grand vision, not, not any sort of timeline, but what, what's the big picture? Um, well, the big picture for Project Positive Change for me is for everybody to be real. I mean, the biggest picture is for it to be like um, Yelp or um, TripAdvisor. If you want to find a solution, you have an app and you'll be like, OK, I'm going to look at Project Positive Change because you know you need change. And then you go, OK, well, this is where I'm going to find it. And the people can find it. And for us to have actual on the ground groups of people that are working together to promote positive change in their community or their country. And right now we have 19 countries represented and um, it's really exciting to see it become like a global 
kind of movement to promote more positivity and because it's so easy to get back into your world even if you are in that space it's you don't have that community it's so easy just to to get back into it and just fall back into being unhappy yeah, yeah. I mean, I've seen so many people. You 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 go to a seminar, a workshop, you get all woo jazzed up. I'm going to change everything. Then you go back home where everything's the same. Like, oh yeah, I forgot everything sucked, and you don't do anything. Yeah. So it, that that notion of community and ongoing support are are tremendously important. Yeah, I think so. It has been for me. It definitely has been. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, any last questions for you, Apio? No, actually, you, uh, you asked the question I was going to ask you about the long-term vision for Project Positive Change, oh. so perfect. <laughs> All right, you want a short-term vision? <laughs> yeah, as far as short-term okay. vision, I mean, what do you see as far as the marketplace and, and uh, the people that would be served? Not, you know, you spoke of it in generic terms, but could you give us some specific examples of, of people who could easily be served by, uh, I know, people who are, for instance, uh, energy workers or other people who are part of the uh, part of the um, project positive change marketplace. People who are looking for those change makers, people who are looking for help. What are some specific examples that they could go to project positive change for? Well, the goal is to put together the people who who want to help each you know or helping each other. So we mm -hmm. want the the people that are the energy workers or the the shamans, the the web builders, the business coaches, to find those people who are seeking those solutions. So if you're a seeker, you can go onto the portal. And if you're someone who's a service provider, then you can have you know a profile on the portal and you can share who you are and what you're, you know, you can share a video, you can share a blog, you can share um, the things that you have to offer. And so somebody can, if they're looking for that solution, they can find you. Did I answer that question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I wasn't quite <laughs> sure what you're talking about. No, you, you gave some very specific examples. Say, for instance, somebody who needs, uh, like, an energy coach or somebody who's looking to um, build a website, but, you know, somebody who's aligned with their vision of having a positive change and, you know, on, on the world through their website or whatever. So, yeah, those are some great examples. So and I really feel like one thing I said the other day, I was talking to somebody and I said, I think that Project Positive Change is like the whole foods of the spiritual community because we have some people that – are a little farther out there, you know, and and then we have some people that are more like business coachy, and it's really a bridge between that practicality and spirituality. So you may be going and, and looking for some exotic thing that most people haven't heard of, or on the other hand, you may be going and looking for um, a business coach. And so I I like Whole Foods, and I think that I, I'm there all the time. You know, I think it's a good it's a good first step for people to walk in and find out what's new. What is what what do you have to offer? What is there in the world? Instead of just going to Kroger, you know, you have a whole lot of more options at Whole Foods and some that may seem a little exotic at first. But the next thing you know, you know, you're eating unami or something. I don't know. You know what I mean? Quinoa. Yeah, exactly. You know, I'm around going, <laughs> what's this? I want to get this. I, yeah, I think that I think that's a great metaphor. There, there's some food you recognize, and some you've never heard of. And try yeah, it all, it, 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 you can try whatever you want. You gotta walk into the store first before you ever find those awesome things that you would never know about if you went to Kroger or Walmart mm -hmm. or the Walmart, as my mother calls it. <laughs> the Walmart, I like that. The Walmart. <laughs> Cool, cool. So, uh, so, so, thanks again for joining us, Lee. Hi. And I do want to let everyone know that that Appy and I are both members of Project Positive Yay. Change. So. That, that's what we knew to ask about it. Um, <laughs> but it is a great organization. Um, join us next week, next Tuesday, July 19th. We'll be live again at 5 p.m. And next week, um, we're being joined by Samuel. We are. Nice. We are. Yes. Um, just leave it at that? Or <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to that. <laughs> okay. Cool. cool. Uh, and, and until then, uh, join us at realmenfield.org. Um, check us out. We have a private Facebook group called Real Men Feel on Facebook, obviously. And you can also check out Project Positive Change on Facebook and at projectpositivechange.com as well. And, uh, yeah. So yeah. thanks for a, a rousing uh, round of uh, painful divorce talk. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right. Thanks again, everybody. Thank thanks, you. guys. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.